All right, my friend, are you still immersed in lumberjack activity? Well, I'm trying to, Pat, but the Tennessee summer is upon us. And oh, yeah. As okay. such, you know, it's been in the 90s and the humidity has been off the charts. So hot work out there for both the saw and myself. So it's been uh, a little slim pickings lately. Although I did, I, uh, I did mill up some nice black locust the other day. Okay, okay. You have to send me some drink coasters. The, um, I will. <laughs> I was trying to think of something that wouldn't be too bad to send in the mail. The, I remember from my time living in Virginia, man, that East Coast humidity in, in the Dude. summer. There's nothing quite, in my mind, there's almost nothing quite like it. I've, I've, been, I've worked out at elevation. I did, I did Fran in Quito, Ecuador at 11,000 feet of elevation, you know, and lived in Denver, Colorado for years. Um, but Denver's not humid. But man, that East Coast humidity it gets thick. Uh, it, it's up there as some of the toughest conditions for like working out, and it's just rugged. Is Tennessee buggy, or is it not too bad? Oh, it gets pretty buggy. Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> so you get you get it all. You get the trifecta. You get it all. You get the heat, the humidity, and the bugs. And um, yep. Oh, what more could you ask for? Okay. Well. Yeah. We get a great question from a VNR listener, and I'm, of course, I'm going to read it. But first of all, everybody, help support the show. Go to verynotrandom.com. Check out all the different cycles that we offer. Actually, now that I think about it, some of them are going to apply to this question if we want to just shamelessly plug them later on. But get your first trick, pull-up, handstand walk, toes-to-bar, ring muscle up. There's barbell work. There's some really great stuff. So check that out. Make yourself a superhero. And then on this other side of the house for gym owners... You need to take care of your billing and your workout tracking and your gym management. BTWB has an all-in-one solution for gym owners, and all you need to do is go to btwb.com, and it will basically be just a treasure trove of amazingness for your gym facility. So, okay, here Love we go. It. This is from Cat D727. This was left on the YouTubes. Says, hey, Pat and Paul is a huge fan of the podcast. It's the only CrossFit podcast that captures my full attention. Hey, uh, I'll take that. That's, here we a, go. that's a great compliment. We're off uh, to a great start. <laughs> and they say, before I get to my question, thanks to the mom who posted about not getting enough sleep due to kids. Uh, Pat saying that he's been tired for three years helped me feel better. Anyway, here's my question. One of my favorite episodes is the one where you spoke with Dave Durante. And for anyone who wants to know, that was episode 135. You want to go back and check that out. Gymnastics is one of my main weaknesses. I was working with a CrossFit coach three times a month. We were just starting to get into gymnastics work, and my family had to move. So therefore, I could no longer work with this coach due to distance, joined another gym, made some enough money at my new job, signed up for a limited membership, 12 classes a month, However, after not too long, not too long after I signed up, the owners decided recently to cut out skill work on gymnastics movements because the class attendance for those workouts was low. I was heartbroken when this announcement was made. I didn't sign up for a quote unquote barbell club. I signed up for CrossFit. So when the workouts have gymnastics in them, I have to scale way down like ring rows instead of pull-ups. I'm okay with scaling, but I would like to eventually do more advanced gymnastics work. My coaches do have a band set across the rig, uh, the rig so I could do my pull-ups there. However, I thought about what Pat said in an earlier episode that I may have to quote-unquote thank the band for doing that pull-up. <laughs> I think I understand what he meant because I felt like the band was helping me way too much. We do have an open gym, but there's not a coach during that time, and it's not really a scheduled class. What can I do on my own to become better at gymnastics? Are there some resources out there that I can help myself preferably free, money's tight, and I can't really afford afford anything additional. So there we have it. There's 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 an obvious question in there, but then I think there's a couple of the just like more interesting, subtle things. Yeah, I think so too. I think uh, number one, good on you for, you know, kind of having the breadth of view that you're not signing up for a CrossFit gym to really have this specialized fitness that only has one or two applications whether that's a barbell, whether that's distance running, whether that's whatever. Um, I think that's great that you have that kind of breadth of view. I think sometimes I, people I love are, that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think sometimes people are, you know, um, they're just happy to, to get along, to go along and, and do what the group class is going to be doing. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that, you know, at a certain point, you do have to relinquish some of that control to the affiliate owner and the programmer. Um, but it's also important to step back and say, okay, is this actually serving the needs that I want it to? Am I getting that well-roundedness that I've 
come to expect from engaging in CrossFit. So that's great to be able to have that, that kind of independent thinking around it and say, okay, this isn't exactly what I want. I think that's the first step. And mm-hmm. if you have that kind of seed planted mentally, I think that there is no reason that you cannot achieve whatever gymnastics goals that you have, um, even if it's not in line with exactly what the affiliate's doing. I think that's the first step right there. Once you get that mentality, the rest of it's going to fall into place. Yes, and we'll most certainly, don't let me forget, we'll circle back to that of if you are that fired up, you're that dedicated, you're proactive with the wonders of the interweb and a small yep. amount of time a few days a week, you can achieve your gymnastics goals. So yes. that's that's the short answer that we're going to somehow make 25 to 30 minutes. But <laughs> the the other thing which which popped out at me, which you know was just one of the lines that they wrote, but I, I have to think it's rather ubiquitous probably to a lot of gym owners. Gym owners are in a tough situation for many, many reasons. You could be open seven days a week. Working out seven days in a row is silly and nonsense, uh, but you have to program for seven days a week. But you don't know which day your members are going to come in. So like, it's, they, the gym owners are in a tough spot no matter what. And then not everybody who walks through your door is this like CrossFit veteran, you know, washed in the methodology and understands the importance of getting outside my comfort zone and doing diff- difficult things and how important scaling and modifying it. Some people just, you know, that's their hour they got after work before they get home with the kids and I want to get in, move a little weight around, get a sweat and go home and I, I don't want to read the CrossFit Journal. Thanks. I want to come in and come out. And I could see like there's a lot of people in the world like that. And sure. now you're this gym owner who you probably opened a CrossFit gym because you love CrossFit and love the methodology and love helping people and understand it, you know, preferably. And now you've got a bunch of people, or maybe, you know, this might happen to some gym, gym owners that, hey, this, this gym owner is all fired up. Hey, we're going to do things right at this gym. We're going to get back to basics, virtuosity, fundamentals, man, people's gymnastics. It's so overlooked and suffering. Great news, everybody. Gymnastics practice is going to be on the docket regularly. Everyone's going to love it. A lot of people are not going to love it. It, they they should, and it would be wildly beneficial to a lot of people, but I bet it wouldn't be as popular as it. Great news, everybody. We're starting a barbell club. That's mm-hmm. probably going to be way more warmly received than the gymnastic skill training club or the 800-meter repeat club. <laughs> That's not going to have a lot of attendance right there either. And the yeah. popularity of those things isn't indicative of their value or worth or how much they'll drive your fitness for it. It's just human beings are human beings. It's a lot more fun to crank some ACDC and pull some deads than it is to, you know, work a difficult isometric hold in gymnastics or something like that or go to the track Mm -hmm. and sprint until you vomit. It's just kind of one of those things. So I feel for what this VNR listener is saying and I also feel for the situation that the gym owner as well, because they obviously had this as part of their regime. It did exist. And then sadly, they read the room and they were like, this is dying. And if it dies too much, we do have to have members showing up to keep the lights on and pay the lease and like, et cetera, et cetera. So now the gymnastics went away. And I think that's a sad but true situation that is um, probably more common than we realize. Yeah, I think you're right. And I I think there's something else in there too from the coaching perspective and having sympathy for it is that, you know, every coach is going to have their own strengths and weaknesses regarding what they're comfortable coaching, you know, and so many people are going to fall into kind of a niche interest and they're amazing at coaching that, but they might not be as confident coaching something else. And so that could be the case too, where it's like, hey, I'm going to coach to what I really know and what I know that I can convey to my members well. And so you start shying away and that can have the trickle down effect of maybe it's not that the members are just on their face, uninterested in these gymnastics movements, but the coaching isn't strong in that the coach feels like they're not very confident and it kind of spirals onto itself. So that's one thing that I guess I would say being sympathetic to the coach is, you know, I think the novice tries to put themselves in this uh, situation where categorically they're the expert on everything and they don't approach coaching, especially coaching a broad range of skills like this with the humility that it deserves sometimes, it is totally okay to be a coach that understands you know, some of their limitations and Absolutely. basically grows, yeah, grows and learns those skill sets along with the athletes that they're coaching. You know what I mean? So it, it's mm-hmm. kind of a nice thing when you can get your own ego out of it 
you can step back and say, okay, Pat doesn't know how to walk on his hands. I don't know how to coach walking on his hands, <laughs> right. uh, but we can learn this together and we're both going to get some benefit out of this. I'm going to refine yes. my coaching game so the next Pat, metaphorically, can step in and I can get him there a little quicker. Pat's going to get the benefit of my attention and well rounding, you know, rounding out his skill set. Um, but it is going to take some humility to recognize that, hey, this, this skill set may be holding back my entire population. So that, that's something that could be in the mix too. I don't know. That's a, yes. that's a tough speculation here. There's a question I have that, that I can't seem to pull out of it exactly where it lands. Maybe, maybe when you heard it or read it, you did. <clears throat> because what they said was, owners decided to cut out skill work on, on gymnastics moves because class attendance for the workouts was low. So I don't know if that's meant that there was dedicated gymnastics skills and practice days that were considered workouts. Uh, if so, I can see that going in the direction that they yeah. said. But the other part is, in my ideal world, if they're not trying to pack too much into an hour, right, that you would think there would be this 10 to 15 minute window during any particular class hour to work on whatever skill happens to be in the workout of the day that is maybe a bit challenging. Hey, it's Elizabeth. We're doing hang squat cleans. That's a challenging movement. Good news. we got 15 minutes. We're going to start building up the weight. And I'm going to walk around and give you some personal attention, which by default is you getting better at that movement. Great. Hey, today's got toes to bar. Today's got chest to bar pull-ups. It's got, you know, it has a gymnastics moves. Great. We finished our general warm-up. We're going to take 10 or 15 minutes as we get ready for it to slowly increase the load and work on some tips and tricks that are going to make you better in the worker like that ideally in my mind would be factored into almost any class setting but it sounds like and again i can't ask this person that question but if the if it was a gymnastics hour that used to exist and that's now gone i hope and pray that at least what i just mentioned is still available to the clientele and, and that should scratch that itch a little but Maybe that's not happening since it it kind of seems like it was an all or nothing if I'm reading the question right. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that that's uh, very important that these things are kind of baked into the cake uh, on a regular basis. And it doesn't have to be just like relegated to this one day where it's all or nothing, like you said. I think that'd be a really interesting follow up for this person. Um, and digging in a little bit as far as like, from the athlete side, why people may or may not show up to days like that. Um, I think, honestly, there's kind of two thoughts that go into my mind right away when you kind of created that great example of, hey, we got the opportunity to lift some bars and throw down, lift, lift, some, lift some weights, listen to some, some music. ACDC, man. Yep. Just get together and have a good time. Alternatively, we can come in <laughs> and work on some of these skills that are going to require, you know, being put in a position that's not comfortable and you don't see progress in any sort of, like, fast time frame. The progress is glacial. It's like mm -hmm. developing flexibility. It happens slowly over time. And somebody who hasn't seen you in a while or seen you display this skill or that range of motion before, they'll come in and be like, wow, you're making great progress. But right. day to day, you don't feel that because it's so slow. And I think that's hard for people to, uh, to, to recognize. Um, whereas the barbell, it's like, yeah, you see that five pounds, that 10 pound jump, you know, maybe bigger if you're newer and you're, you're seeing some, some great progress. I mean, that's awesome. And it's objective and it's easy to see. Not so much in some of these other things. And then, you know, like getting out there on the track, it's just hard. Not only is the progress slow, but it's also very, very demanding. So, yeah, there, it is interesting to, to kind of think about people's motivations around these different movement modalities. But to shift the conversation a little bit towards, all right, well, what do you do? So we've talked, you know, quite a bit around... You know, some of the, the factors around this, but, but what do you actually do given that there's not going to be a ton of attention and you've kind of accepted that? Mm -hmm. I think the first step is just identifying what are the movements that you think are the primary ones you personally need to focus on. Make a list of those so that at least you've got some organization with your time outside of the normal class structure. Um, because if it's just like, hey, gymnastics needs to be better mm -hmm. and you take this scattershot approach where... I mean, that could be 20 different movements. Sure. And if you don't have a plan to prioritize those, it's going to be, you know, just kind of touching on certain things once in a while. You're probably going to take what already takes a long time to develop and extend that out even slower. So first priority in my mind is, okay, identify the ones that you think are top of the list, write them down, and make sure that, 
you know, those are the ones you're dedicating your time to initially. That can change over time, but, but take that first step. And you're going to find some um, foundational building blocks en route to whatever is the cool, sexy stuff that you want to do, right? Whether it's the yep. uh, the ring muscle-ups or the whatever. Like, you know, if you don't have it yet, we got to develop some some strict pull-ups, some really serious, you know, pressing capacity, whether it's ring dips, bar dips, bench dips or something. Um, some support hold positions, you know, top of the rings, uh, very strong and stable or... You know, working yourself into a handstand support position, which right now maybe seems like a thousand miles away, but that can start with just a push up, and then it's a pike push up, and then your feet are on a box, and then it's like, mm -hmm. like you know, there's these incremental steps of of doing it intelligently and deliberately, so you don't just day one try to kick up and just collapse down onto the floor. That again, like you're saying, but the progress does take a long time, but there is a roadmap, and if you have the mm -hmm. discipline and the dedication, especially with the good old interwebs. You can find any, darn near any progression you want for any of the movements listed there to get your pull-ups, to get your dips, to get your handstand walk, to get your handstand push, to get your handstand hold, you know, whatever it happens to be, to develop. And every, all of this is going to be benefited with like a rock solid midline that eventually helps you with the toes to bar, the ring muscle ups, you have like the whole nine yards. And none of that stuff is like overly sexy, like a rock mm -hmm. hard, uh, you know, midline capacity, dips and pull-ups. But that baseline right there is gonna be so beneficial to everything that you need to do. And it can be done um, with a beautifully laid out linear sequence that you find online, I'm sure exists by the hundreds for free. Or it also is probably something that you know intuitively um, if, you give, if you've been doing CrossFit for a while, which it sounds like, like what I just said, we're gonna work on your hand, a uh, regular push up and then, you know, pike push up and then your feet are on a box. Like you're like, okay, I can follow the bouncing ball on that, you know, and I might mess up how long to stay at each one or the number of repetitions. But if you're following something like that, you're, you're developing competency at something. And then when you develop a degree of competency, you, you bump up the challenge. When you develop a degree of competency, you bump up the challenge. And you, you know, they mentioned doing ring rows regularly in place of pull-ups. And that's an interesting thing because ring rows can be this, to use this as an example for other gymnastics movements, can be this dead end of like, ah, I always have to do ring rows. You know, like I'm never going to get the pull-up. Okay. But there's so many ways to do ring rows. Like mm -hmm. you can, and, and ring rows are so beautiful and I think underutilized because they're infinitely scalable in the blink of an eye, just by the angle that you change your body, where it's like, you gotta go get a different band of the pull-up or whatever. I mean, you just shift your feet a little bit and ring rows are like, you can do a set of 50 unbroken because you're barely, you're basically standing up straight or you keep kicking your feet all the way down to your body's like parallel with the ground or your feet are on a box. You can make ring rows equally as difficult as a dead hang pull-up if you want. Or you can, you know, have a one second pause at the top. You can do them slower, like ring rows are amazing. And as you develop the capacity, you keep increasing the angle of your body so that the sets of ring rows are difficult, always difficult. Then you can eventually be like in a seated position on the floor. Like now you're doing quote unquote ring rows, but they're ring pull-ups. Feet are kicked out in front of you. You're still, they're still like ring dip height, right? You know, that you would do ring rows on but now you're doing more of a pull. Like again, they're so scalable and they can meet you wherever you're at, regardless of your ability level, regardless of the number of rounds or reps in the workouts, you could get a strict dead hang pull up with nothing but a set of rings that you played around with on a regular basis. But it just, you'd have to have yourself a game plan and have some patience, but it sounds like you've got both. You can achieve your gymnastics goals, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I'll say that I think this is one of the best applications of the use of social media. You know, I think you can say what you will about the ills of social media, and I think there are plenty, but there's also some really amazing things, and that is there are more people than ever that have a lot of great information that they put out every single day. And it can be kind of difficult to sift through the noise because there's just so much of it. Mm -hmm. But you compare that to even, you know, 10 years ago, and the amount of people that you could learn these types of skills from was radically reduced. There just wasn't as much out there. Whereas today, you can kind of take your pick. You can find some personalities that you like online. You like the way that they teach. You like the way they present information. You can go down the rabbit hole of their particular style. You know, and there's many ways to the top of the mountain for any one of these skills. 
And so that would be my advice is, hey, just spend some productive time on social media. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but <laughs> right. find, find some personalities that you like and then dig into their material. Chances are they're giving away a ton of it for free you know, on their Instagram or their YouTube or whatever it happens to be. Um, I, I'll give you one name. I'll throw a name out there. You know, uh, Pamela Gagnon, I think, yes. is one of the yes. best in, in the business at this. And she has a ton of amazing drills specifically for gymnastics, a ton of experience with that. She's a great instructor. And, uh, you know, I think she's one of the best ones um, for, for anybody who's looking to improve their skills at just kind of basic CrossFit gymnastics. So, so find some of these personalities and, and dig in on them because like Pat said, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel of these progressions. They exist out there. You just have to have, you know, kind of the self-awareness to understand what your weaknesses are currently, what your priorities are, and then the discipline to actually follow through on it. I would also say money well spent. Um, and again, I know, I know they just said money is tight. So to, just to use that as a phrase, money well spent, because it sounds like the gym you're working on, it has bands. So to be, so to clarify what I said earlier about sometimes you might need to thank the band for your pull-up, <laughs> that, that was an oversimplification that a lot of times it's really easy to grab a band that gives you more help than you want. That's the mm -hmm. oversimplification. You sh the band... Is the band is your friend, like I said, if it's not your friend. If it makes you work harder than you want, that's the band that you want to grab. And so it can be just really simple to grab a band that you know you're going to be an unbroken hero over the course of the five-round workout. Cool. You logged a nice score. You got a good position on the leaderboard. But if we said, screw the leaderboard, screw all that stuff, I'm like, why am I in the gym? Well, I'm in the gym for an effective strength and conditioning session. Okay, cool. Well, what are the areas that you're struggling? Well, one of them really is pull-ups. Okay, great. Well, what do you need to do to get better at pull-ups? You don't need to choose a super easy band that doesn't make you work. That's not what you need to do. What you need to do is say, this is an area of improvement. Like anything that requires improvement, is, has, improvement is going to come with when I accept that I have to struggle. You know, and, that, and through that struggle, there's an adaptation that occurs in my body. That's what, But I need that struggle. The band never has you struggle. You're just going to be stuck in that band forever. So grab a band that, I don't know, if there's sets of 10 pull-ups per round, don't get all 10 unbroken. Because, you know, that's over the course of a five-round workout with mm -hmm. a jacked heart rate and other elements that probably are interfere with that. It's not like everyone's going to be hopping up there and just ripping out 10 pull-ups. There's going to be a lot of people that have been doing CrossFit for years that break those suckers up. So you most certainly should be breaking them up if you're working on them. They should, you should hop off that in that example you should hop off that pull-up bar at least once each time. Break it up at least once to get to that 10. If not, in rounds like four and five, when you're quite fatigued, it turns into a four, three, three to get to, to 10. That's totally cool. And like, that's the band you want to grab. And if you think about that application to whatever the workout happens to be, I think it'll generally be on a good path. Yeah, definitely. Uh, last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about here, maybe two last things, but... Uh, it's just this idea of timing and open gym, et cetera. Uh, you know, I think she mentioned that they oh, yes, do she did. offer yeah. an open gym time, and that's cool, but it's relatively unstructured and unsupervised, so she'd kind of have to come with her own plan. I think that's one option, you know, to show up to these open gym times, figure out the progressions that you want to focus on, spend some time on them. That's a pretty easy uh, kind of way to approach this problem. I think what's also very possible is showing up 10 minutes early or staying 10 minutes after to work on these things outside of the normal class time. Now, obviously, if it's a small affiliate and you know time's a little tight with schedule, you don't want to be like taking over the... Adrian said I could disrupt the class. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't be that person that's like, no, 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 I got to finish. I got to finish my set, bro, before yeah. uh, you know the next wave of the class is coming in. They're trying to use the equipment. That's not what I'm suggesting. But... Typically speaking, there will be little gaps here and there, and especially for something like these you know, types of skills that do take some time to develop, in my experience, it's better to see and touch them regularly and to do that frequently, you know, as often as you can, rather than like, okay, once a week I do a monster session on it. Mm -hmm. I, I find that you're going to get a lot Absolutely. more utility yep, out of, you know, okay, I go to the gym three, four days a week. Every time I'm there, I just get a little bit of work and move the needle forward just a little bit further. That, to me, is going to be another way that you can kind of explore this. Um, and, and particularly with something that's hard, you know, you just can't spend that much time on it because you're going to fatigue easily. Sooner or later, 
usually a lot sooner than people give it credit for, there's going to be some diminishing returns on that. You know, you can only work through that uh, ring row progression that you're talking about with mm -hmm. quality movement before your muscles are totally fatigued, you know, so many times. It's not going to be an hour-long session that it takes to get you there. Trust me, it's going to be a lot sooner than that. Absolutely. So, so taking those little doses and doing what you can with them, I think, is one of the, the secrets, if there are any, to really kind of maximizing your efficiency with these sorts of things. Yeah, agreed. Um, I mean, that's that's all I got for him, to be quite honest with you. Did you was that both of your nuggets, or was that just one? Uh, no, I had one more, and that was just this idea that, you know, I know we're talking about gymnastics progressions right now, but... I think the same basic concept applies to anybody, regardless of the movement that they happen to be struggling with. So to go back to your kind of three example um, idea there, you know, you can have a lifting category, uh, you know, a, a running kind of track category and a gymnastics category. This same strategy could be overlaid as a template across any of them. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be right. exclusively <laughs> the domain of gymnastics, you know. So. You could be talking about this uh, just in terms of any weakness. Take a step back, identify it, prioritize it, figure out a progression that you understand and, and you know can make sense of, and it's not going to require a lot of external uh, you know visibility to do it, and then fit it in the cracks where you can. And if you have that opportunity to get to the open gym and once in a while and, and layer on top of that too, that's great. But don't rely on that as your only expression, in my opinion. 100%. Well, they'll have a pull-up in no time. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully, <laughs> so hopefully that helps. Great question. Thanks <clears throat> Thanks for the cool shout-out. Again, this is a huge fan of the podcast. Only one that captures my full attention. That's awesome. Obviously, as we say all the time, like, yeah, I guess this is, you know, Adrian and I, it's our show, but it's not really our show. It's, it's all of you out there own the show. We serve you. Love the questions, love the content, love the feedback. So... If you've got an idea, if you've got a thought about this particular topic, some secrets to share, <clears throat> or an upcoming show idea, go to the BTWB YouTube channel, find this show, leave it in the comments. You can also go to the Very Not Random Instagram page, and you can post a public comment. We see those things about the show or upcoming topic you'd like addressed. Or if you want to have a bit more anonymity, you can send a direct message through the Very Not Random Instagram account. We get those as well. So, for Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we'll see you next time.